And welcome back, everyone, to the final section of our program. We will move on shortly to a high-ranking panel on Europe's future role. But let us first start with one last clip from the very sobering documentary, I, Human. This one picks up on the messages that we've heard throughout our discussion and is entitled, AI Needs Regulation. AI is inevitable. We need to make sure we have the necessary human regulation to prevent the weaponization of artificial intelligence. We don't need any more weaponization of such a powerful tool. One of the most critical things, I think, is the need for international governance. We have an imbalance of power here. So now we have corporations with more power, might, and ability than entire countries. How do we make sure that people's voices are getting heard? It can't be a law-free zone. It can't be a rights-free zone. We can't embrace all of these wonderful new technologies for the 21st century without trying to bring with us the package of human rights that we fought so hard uh, to achieve and that remains so fragile. AI isn't good and it isn't evil either. It's just going to amplify the desires and goals of whoever controls it. And the AI today is under the control of a very, very small group of people. The most important question that we humans have to ask ourselves at this point in history requires no technical knowledge. It's the question of what sort of future society do we want to create with all this technology we're making? What do we want the role of humans to be in this world? clear appeal there for effective AI regulation. What role can the Council of Europe and the EU play? Can they build bridges as international standard setters for the regulation of artificial intelligence? That topic, which we touched upon in our last panel, we now want to deepen and broaden in our final very high-ranking panel. And I will introduce the participants in just a moment, but let me urge you once again, ladies and gentlemen, to please also send us your questions to participate by going to the conference website and sending us your comments or questions. And after a few rounds of discussion, I will then bring them into our exchange. And now it's my pleasure to introduce in alphabetic order, Professor Dr. Christian Kastrup, he is State Secretary at the German Federal Ministry of Justice and Consumer Protection with Responsible for Digital Society Issues. Previously, he served as Director of the Bertelsmann Foundation's Europe's Future Program and also as Director of the OECD Department of Policy Studies. And he joins us from Berlin. A warm welcome. Hello to you. Also with us is Jan Kleissen. He is Director of Information Society and Action Against Crime within the Council of Europe's Directorate General Human Rights and the Rule of Law. He's an international lawyer, formerly with the European Commission of Human Rights, and he's been with the Council of Europe since 1983, and he joins us from Strasbourg. Welcome. Great to have you with us. 
Also with us is Michael O'Flaherty. He is director of the EU Agency for Fundamental Rights, FRA, the independent body that was established in 2007 to help safeguard the values, rights, and freedoms enshrined in the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. He was previously director of the Irish Center for Human Rights, and he's also served as chief commissioner of the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission, and he joins us from Vienna. And we're also very pleased to have with us Gabriela Ramos. She's Assistant Director General for the Social and Human Sciences at UNESCO. And she has overseen the drafting of UNESCO recommendations on the ethics of AI. Previously, she worked with the OECD as Chief of Staff to the G20, G7, G7 APEC and as Director of the OECD Office in Mexico and Latin America. And finally, I'm very pleased to welcome Sala Sastamoinen. She is Acting Director General of the European Commission's Directorate General for Justice and Consumers. And she's also served in the past as Director in Charge of Equality and Non-Discrimination at DG Justice. And she joins us from Brussels. So very, very great honor to have all of you with us for this uh, closing discussion of today's conference. And I would like to begin with uh, a, uh, a brief outline of your own organization's thinking and approaches with regard to AI regulation. So we've heard a lot about different building blocks, different scopes, uh, different possible uh, ways of, of mitigating some of the risks that we've talked about. Now I'd like to know what principles, processes, and scope you consider appropriate and what your particular government, institution, or organization's path forward is likely to look like. And I suggest we start with the EU Commission, uh, FRA, and UNESCO, and then come back to Germany and and the Council of Europe. So please, Sala uh, Sastamoinen, uh, that would give you the first word. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for the organizers for inviting me uh, to this panel. Good afternoon to all the participants around uh, Europe. Uh, uh, so from the side of the European Commission, uh, we are on this uh, reflection process on the AI already some years. Uh, what we, how we are seeing it, we see it in, let's say, from two perspectives. We are talking about ecosystems. We talk about the ecosystem of excellence, which promotes the excellence of the AI. And that is an area where we use mostly the financing instruments like uh, investments, coordination of research, fostering relevant skills. Uh, uh, I think at the, in, in this conference, we have more looked about the second uh, ecosystem, our, how we call it, ecosystem of trust. And it is in this framework, we are uh, reflecting and considering the regulation of the AI in the European Union. Uh, uh, our proposals, uh, uh, which are under uh, preparation, they are based on the long-term uh, consultation process, and the Commission positions were last presented last year in the white paper on the AI. And you ask about certain principles that we have uh, we have followed. Uh, we are we want to look at the AI as a risk from a risk-based approach uh, that. Uh, does not limit innovation, but ensures the respect of fundamental rights. So here you see the European Union uh, a background approach, which uh, uh, considers the, the, the innovation, promotion, internal market aspects, and at the same time, the European Union as a union of values, as an area where fundamental rights are then, uh, are then also promoted and uh, protected. Uh, if we think about this, uh, the, the, I said that we take a risk-based uh, risk approach, uh, so specifically uh, for, for the uh, high-risk uh, area, we want to have a systems that are transparent, that are traceable, and that are under the human control. So this, uh, the human control is then something uh, that is part of this human approach to the AI that is based uh, basic of the policies. Uh, 
uh, human control should also uh, come into uh, into application so that the uh, authorities are empowered to check the AI system. So we want to have also their public oversight uh, in the uh, in this area. When I talk about the respect of fundamental rights, we have the common European uh, uh, human rights in the European Convention of Human Rights. We have the European Charter of Fundamental Rights, and we have naturally the EU treaty-based values, uh, which are all in the background and important uh, principles behind. I, when I talk on the EU, we have to then naturally remember that union is then combination or can work uh, uh, according to the basic of general principles that are the proportionality. So if we talk about the regulation, it has to have a proportional approach and then subsidiarity. So it means that we do in the EU level what is then goes beyond the member states. So this is in this space that we have launched our internal uh, process uh, to go ahead. Thank you very much. And uh, perhaps just uh, one brief follow-up question, if I may. You mentioned the white paper. As I understand it, you also plan to build on that with a legislative proposal later on this year. When is that to be expected? And uh, will it also take this same kind of risk-based uh, approach that you're talking about and a, a kind of a fundamental rights foundation? Indeed, our path forward uh, from the white paper has been uh, this consultative process that I mentioned. So we had, uh, uh, we were carrying uh, on the white paper, put the basic uh, their principles. We carried out the public consultation uh, last year, and uh, now we are on the way of preparing the legislative proposal that you mentioned. Our uh, timing is the first quarter of 21. So that means that it is the the, the income coming months when this type of the hori more horizontal framework uh, uh, would be would be then proposed. Uh, it is part of the Commission uh, work program for 21, so certainly part of the priorities in the, our headline ambition of, uh, for more digital Europe. And it uh, indeed it builds on the principles of the uh, white paper. It looks uh, uh, it looks about the uh, uh, risks, uh, including documentation, testing, accountability requirements. Um, uh, it builds also then in this uh, fundamental rights. That is the uh, let's say the uh, uh, major part, and uh, uh, talks about the need for the supervisory authorities. I mentioned that that we we, we want to have also the public oversight of this area. Thank you very much. Let me go now to Mr. Ofleati. And uh, last year, FRA also published its findings on AI risks and regulation. And your study draws on interviews, expert observations, use cases, a lot of uh, a lot of concrete evidence uh, in in there. What are the key messages in regard to future AI legislation, and what principles? processes and or scope would be necessary and appropriate in your view. Uh, thank you very much, Melinda. Thanks to the German Presidency and the Council of Europe for today's event. Another great event on AI organized by the Council of Europe. I've appreciated it greatly. Um, our role, of course, is one of providing support to the lawmakers and the policymakers, supporting work such as that that Salah has just laid out. Uh, and we do that, by the way, in very close cooperation with the Council of Europe. And we always do it, uh, including the research you just mentioned, but also earlier research on AI with some fundamental underlying assumptions. I'll quickly mention those in a will, principles, if you will. The first is there's no debate about whether human and fundamental rights apply. Of course they do. They apply as much online as offline. This is a cardinal uh, thing to keep in mind. So the European Convention on Human Rights is directly relevant here, as is the Charter of Fundamental Rights for the EU. This matters because it means the ethics or law debate is a jaded one. It, it doesn't work. It's simply not the correct debate. Uh, and it's also not about law or ethics. Uh, we need both. Uh, ethics will continue to play an important role subordinate to the principles uh, in the human rights standards. Second, it's not an area that's a terra nullius in terms of regulation. As we heard from earlier panels, we do have applied sectoral regulation, such as in the EU context GDPR, but it's not enough. 
It only deals with one narrow band of issues. As we look for further regulation, to echo your previous discussion, we need a blend of hard and soft law. It's been well discussed today. I won't develop it further, but both are needed. Uh, but as to the content of that regulation, the issue of definitions, uh, as is always the case in these meetings, it took a lot of discussion earlier today. I just want to endorse what Professor Valk said in the last panel. We can do a lot of work without precise definitions. We're used to it in the human rights world of working with uh, uh, terms uh, that are not overly pinned down. In terms of the substance of the instruments, they've got to be very wide, embracing all of human rights. But that was echoed in your panels today. It's about privacy, but it's also about social rights. It's about freedom of expression. It's about freedom of movement. And I could go on and on. Uh, and in terms of discrimination, that interesting discussion you had earlier, um, it, it's a all of the grounds of discrimination are relevant here. But let's be careful about inventing new discrimination grounds. Um, the last thing I'd say about the content of regulation, which uh, principles of ours uh, with the approach to content, is that it's, it's, it's axiomatic of a human rights approach that whatever regulatory solutions uh, uh, are, propo are proposed, they contain guarantees for transparency and accountability. This is necessary uh, for a human rights approach. Now, let me wrap up by briefly coming back to the study we issued in December on use cases, uh, because we did find some very interesting applied empirical evidence directly relevant to making good law here. For example, we found from our research across EU member states that the primary driver for AI is not quality outcomes, it's efficient outcomes. Now, that's relevant because that means you could be that bit more careless about your outcome than you might be if your dedicated focus was quality. And secondly, another clear finding from our interviews across the public and the private sectors was that there's goodwill towards ethics, there's goodwill towards values and rights, but there's a very low level of awareness of what that means in practice. In particular, in the private sector, the only right, human right that seems to be well understood is privacy. But when you get to the massively important area, as you saw in the whole discussion this afternoon, of non-discrimination, in including um, unintended discrimination, there's a lot of confusion. Um, and I want to say just one last thing with your permission. I want to echo something that Matthias Spielkamp spoke of earlier, and that's to recall that we're not dealing with magic here. Artificial intelligence is some is not some great frightening external force uh, over which we've lost control, not at all. It's, it's, it's a technology designed by humans, uh, managed by humans. And so therefore, applying a human and fundamental rights to it is eminently doable as long as we have the will. Thank you. May I just ask you a brief follow-up question? Um, when you say that perhaps there's inadequate understanding or attention paid to the way that certain applications of AI could impinge on the right not to be discriminated. Does that mean, you say we shouldn't define lots of new rights, but does that mean we do need some form of um, elaboration about what's at stake? And wh what would that look like? Oh, look, it's many things. Uh, on the one hand, it, it's, um, it's, it's guidelines, it's roadmaps for practitioners in industry. Uh, they can't be expected to be born as human rights scholars. They need help to figure out what this looks like in practice. And they tell me when I speak to them that they're not getting enough help and they don't have enough internal capacity. I've even had this conversation with the Silicon Valley giants who say, well, look, we're open to this, we need help. And so th th that's one very practical dimension. And another dimension is the mix of the hard and soft law approaches. Um, depending on the levels of risk, we're going to have to have a, a, an ever more uh, locked in uh, binding framework. But that, that can loosen up at, at, at another end of the scale uh, where the applications of artificial intelligence are rather benign. Uh, but but we, need to, we need to do the map, and that's uh, very much what the Fundamental Rights Agency is committed to, mapping the applications of AI uh, uh, so that we get beyond the, uh, the notion. That, look, your film was interesting and it had value, but it, it zeroes in consistently on the scary bits. Uh, and, and it doesn't adequately address the benign bits or even the ones that are inherently fantastically good for human well-being, such as for the rolling out of a vaccine, let's say. Uh, but we need to do that mapping and then uh, build our risk pyramid uh, and apply to the different risks, the different levels of, 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 of legal control. 
Thank you. Very interesting indeed. Um, Ms. Ramos, let me come now to you and, uh, and UNESCO. And I mentioned uh, the recommendations on the ethics, ethics of AI whose drafting you supervised. They list also fundamental principles and values and propose ethical impact assessments as a tool for evaluating AI systems. Can you tell us a little bit more about that approach? Well, I guess that, uh, well, thank you so much first for this invitation and, and, and we're really pleased to, to, to be here with you in this very interesting uh, discussion. I believe that uh, uh, the whole um, environment has uh, been colored by what happened with COVID. I think that we need to frame the discussion with that because that had been an acceleration, a massive acceleration in the use of AI on data gathering and on the systems that we rely to, to overcome the pandemic. And I think this is important because it calls for the attention on something that has been said in some of the panels, and I'm sure that we will be repeating it. We need to translate the infrastructure of the rule of law that we have in the analog world in the digital world. There are too many gaps in the digital world that we need to tackle. And, and that's why I'm so pleased to be in UNESCO now, because UNESCO has been the institution that had been looking at the ethical angle of science in general. Do you remember UNESCO was the place where we did, the, developed the ethical aspect of the genome? Technologies are not good or bad. It depends on how you frame them, and it depends on what kind of in, infrastructure you develop for it to, to advance. So the recommendation that we were asked to produce in 2019 uh, takes this approach, the ethical approach. But I have to say that I disagree with some of the ways in which people understand ethics, because ethics incorporates already the human rights frameworks. It incorporates already the SDGs and the goals. It incorporates the human dignity. But the fact that the ethical reflection is a process by which the developers, the governments that are gathering the data, the institutions, the NGOs, can use their ethical reflection to decide whether this is going to be consistent with the respect of human rights and with the respect of human dignity. But there are many developments in the artificial intelligence world, in the scientific world in general, that, that go beyond the framework that we have to respect of human rights. Right now, my inter, the, the inter, uh, International Committee on Bioethics in, in UNESCO is looking at neurotechnologies, is looking at how we protect our brains. That's not codified. We cannot codify everything. It's not possible. And that's why the recommendation, what the recommendation is doing is elevating the debate first to ensure that everything with the, we do with the technologies is based on moral grounds, on, 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 on enhancing the human dignity, is based on principles that you have heard them all. You have heard transparency, you have heard privacy, you have heard uh, explainability, uh, proportionality, there is a very specific angle that I feel is so important because from all the principles, the principle that we are really looking after is accountability. I feel that in some, in some uh, countries, we even uh, prevent accountability of some of the platforms when they publish some content. And I think that uh, the provision 230 of the Decency Act, which is now being called into question in the US, and we'll see what happened with the US administration. But the fact is that we, we need accountability in the system, and then we need redressing mechanism. We need due diligence. What am I talking about? I'm just talking about the hundreds of years that we have in developing the legal frameworks, but we need to translate it into the digital world. I'm not for over-regulating. I agree that regulations, regulations, we need to get them right, and they need to give a space for innovation. But the reality is that with the downsides that we have seen in the, in the COVID in terms of misinformation, in terms of manipulation, in terms of, of hate speech, discrimination, all the biases that we know that are being reproduced in the, in the technologies, we really need a very strong framework for accountability. And this is what we are going after in, the, in, the, in, in UNESCO. We are calling for much better governance. We're com calling for capacity, capacity building, because we have 193 countries. And I have to say that uh, almost 70% uh, are not completely well equipped to deal with, uh, with big platforms and big technological uh, 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 institutions and, 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 and businesses. 
And therefore, it's very important that we go into that. But let me tell you something else. I think that we are also focusing a lot on the development of the technologies, of the softwares, of the, of the algorithms. Or we are calling the whole AI cycle. It's not only the research, the development, the deployment, the, the looking at the impact. Because sometimes, because of, of machine learning or because the black boxes, you don't know what is going inside, and you cannot codify that. But you need to ensure that the outcome is consistent with the human rights. And there is another element. The ethical reflection is not only about the technologies, it's about the business model. We have almost 70% of all the patents that are being developed in this world produced by 200 firms from G7 countries and China. Therefore, we need also to be more inclusive, more diverse. And this is something that we did by engaging with citizens. We did the global consultation, and I don't know how my teams that are listening to me, uh, Daphna Heimfeinholz and all the experts, did to integrate 50,000 comments because it needs to be driven with the conversation with the public. It needs to be multi-stakeholder. It needs to be diverse. If we don't call from the Global South, and I have to say that this conference had been fantastic, but the Global South was not very well represented, how are we going to really ensure that this response to the specific needs and the specific aspects of all the, of, of the international community. And finally, yes, not only the what, but the how, the ethical impact assessment, a readiness index, and then how we build institutions and capacities for the countries to deal with these issues. Thank you very much. And uh, in terms of your point uh, about uh, diversity and uh, the Global South, that was a point that was made very eloquently earlier as well by Francesca Fanucci, talking about the importance of bringing uh, these groups into the discussion. And maybe you can say a word later about how UNESCO is doing that. But let me move on now to uh, to State Minister, uh, to Mr. Kastrup. And uh, clearly, Germany has hosted this event because it absolutely supports the Council of Europe initiative. So please share with us your government's view about the advantages of the approach that is being taken by the Kahai feasibility study that we have been discussing. Where do you see this, uh, this leadership role for Council of Europe as we look toward AI regulation in the future? Yeah, thank you very much, Melinda, and also uh, uh, welcome to all the audience. Uh, and I heard we had a great number of attendants. Uh, that's great for this for the for the subject and also for the Council of Europe. Yeah, um, uh, in fact, I could not join uh, the whole of this uh, very great conference because I just had a meeting with uh, some uh, colleagues uh, from other state federal ministries, and uh, today we discussed uh, a new basic law for autonomous driving and cars and. And uh, to be honest, some colleagues uh, had to be convinced that there is something like AI uh, in the box. Uh, so, <laughs> so I said, these are just cars. I say, no, these cars need certain technologies and these certain technologies need some kind of, uh, say, societal um, backing. Huh? So uh, it's, it's about acceptance and not just about uh, super duper new technologies. So, um, yeah, we support, of course, very much uh, both the inif initiatives by the Council of Europe and, of course, also what but uh, Salah just mentioned uh, the framework for IE to come uh, from the Commission as a proposal. And uh, clearly we share uh, that this is important to look at the impact of AI on humans and on compliance also with the European Charter uh, of Fundamental Rights. So, and of course, we fully support also the human centric approach. And uh, the, the general idea, of course, is that AI has really great chances uh, bringing uh, the humanity forward, but it also includes great, great challenges which can be uh, played against humanity in the end. And uh, this is then also a link to what Gabriella just said about the ethical approach. So, uh, I would strongly uh, support the work and I encourage. Uh, really to to bring a high uh, yeah high so the home run um, I think the feasibility study uh, is really an appropriate legal framework and it will likely consist of something we like very much and this is a combination of a binding horizontal and sectoral legal instruments uh, that complement each other there is much more beyond just the legal side but the legal side I think especially here in this area is also very very important uh, 
so uh, this convention or a framework convention, uh, it's a horizontal piece of work. Uh, it should consist and consolidate a general common principles, transparency, traceability, verifiability, obligations, provisions, uh, all that, and then some sectoral instruments will be needed, I think. Uh, think about uh, the health sector, uh, think about, as I said, autonomous driving, and maybe also uh, public administration. And uh, let me already mention something and support what uh, Sala just said. Of course, uh, we prefer here really a risk-based approach. So uh, risk-based does not mean uh, that only high-risk applications uh, are there or nothing. Yeah? So there is a whole continuum of risks and we really have to make a very balanced approach to look at it. This will be discussed not only in the European Council and in the further work of CAHAI, but also within uh, the European Union, uh, the working the Commission, the Council working groups uh, and the European Parliament. I think there will be a very, very heavy dispute uh, also between the issue of being enough new technology friendly and having this societal uh, backup, so acceptance, transparency, all what is uh, within the, the Kahai uh, um, work. So, uh, yeah, from the German uh, government's perspective, the really true European regulatory uh, framework on, on AI would be essential. We have various players, and I just mentioned some of them. We have the economy, we have, uh, we have the state, uh, we have individuals, and we should not forget uh, the civil society as a kind of a collective body. So we have two um, big brothers a bit, yeah? So it's commercial, the big commercials, and it is the state, and we need a big sister in the middle. And this big sister must also be supported uh, really by uh, Kahai's work, uh, and it needs a legal foundation, because this is very important without any legal foundation of that. Also, strong regulation, risk-based regulation, uh, we won't give uh, this, we won't give the society the security that this is really human-centric and in their interest, uh, and not just in the interest of others where they have no idea of. Thank you. Thank you very much, State Secretary Kastrup. And uh, let me move now to Jan uh, Kleissen. And you are very welcome, if you like, sir, to say a few more words about uh, Kahai's uh, approach and what you consider to be unique and groundbreaking. But since we have covered a good deal of that, I would also like to ask you to talk a little bit about where you see synergies, but also potential divergences to the approaches of other actors and bodies, uh, whether it's the ones that we have represented here on the panel or elsewhere. So with that, I'll toss it to you. Thank you very much, Melinda, and uh, good afternoon to all of you. Um, and a warm thanks also on my part, of course, to our German presidency for having organized this event. Um, it's, uh, of course, difficult to say something about Kahai because so much has already been covered. And I will therefore, in a way, come straight to your question, to your second question, rather, um, by pointing out perhaps why the Council of Europe is so uh, strongly committed to this, to this legal work and what is the angle it sees there uh, and its comparative advantage. And then I come very much to the complementarity uh, because I would say the role uh, in one word, the key word I'd like to use as regards other organizations and other partners is complementarity. Um, since you kindly pointed out that I've been with the Council of Europe since 1983, let me say something about how the Council of Europe has worked in all these years. At least I've had the privilege to be there. Um, the Council of Europe, I think it's important to, to underline, was born out of the ashes of the Second World War. And uh, we were created because governments at the time and leading states, men and women, felt that human rights, rule of law and democracy should not be left to individual countries, but they should be collective guarantees. We should do it together. And on that basis, the Council of Europe elaborated a number of treaties. And treaties, by definition, bring countries together. And our treaties are not just between country A and country B, but they're between groups of countries. Uh, this idea of collective responsibility is very, very important. And um, we do that through, uh, first of all, uh, of course, our member states, but also our parliamentary assembly, bringing together national parliaments. 
and uh, what do these treaties, uh, what is the purpose of these treaties? The purpose is that they uh, set out rules uh, which states voluntarily accept, uh, to which they commit, uh, and uh, uh, under which they will uh, not, uh, or they will refrain from uh, interfering with human rights, rule of law, and democracy. On the contrary, they will uphold these principles in a series of areas. And they should do so uh, themselves, and they should also ensure, and both of these aspects are very important in the context of artificial intelligence, they should not uh, themselves violate human rights, uh, but they should also not ensure that others do not do so. The, so, the, the so-called positive obligations, uh, that when states commit to certain principles, it's their own behavior, but also the behavior of those that are under, within, their, within their jurisdictions and for, which, uh, for whom they're responsible. Um, then when such treaties are established, uh, we uh, do follow up the implementation of these standards. We do that through committees of the parties, uh, through expert bodies, uh, in a particular case, the Convention on Human Rights, we even established a supranational uh, judicial body to oversee the implementation of that convention. But most conventions are looked after by committees of the parties. Uh, they do two things. Uh, they they uh, exchange best practices. So uh, who, what can we learn from each other uh, in order to best implement the principles we have agreed upon? And when necessary, they also criticize and hold countries to account when the obligations are not met through peer pressure, if you like. And again, all these principles, I think, are, are very, very relevant to uh, this working methods, this business model, if you like, of the Council of Europe. Collective responsibility, best practice, peer pressure, uh, all very much apply to the area of, of uh, AI. And I think it is also in this respect that we are complementary to other organizations. Uh, and I'll come to a conclusion. Uh, we share 27 countries with the European uh, Union, all European member states are in the Council of Europe. We share, interestingly enough, also 27 uh, states with the OECD. Uh, we share all 47 with UNESCO. All of our member states are, are also with UNESCO. So there's a lot of complementarity there. Um, and I, I heard very carefully what Gabriel said about the Global South. But some of the conventions, some of these 200 treaties we have established, have become really global standards. They were mentioned, but there are a few details about them I'd like to add, and then I really I will stop for the moment. Is the Cybercrime Convention, for instance? It brings together 65 countries, uh, full parties on an equal basis, many of them from the global south. And in 2019, before the pandemic hit us, we were active in 130 countries worldwide. So well beyond the European area. Uh, the Data Protection Convention is another one. There we have 55 state parties and 70 countries that participate in our work. So in a number of areas, and especially when it comes to new technologies, uh, the Council of Europe, although a regional body, has established really global benchmarks. And interestingly enough, data protection was established 40 years ago, uh, the cybercrime 20 years ago. So since we are about to, since we set apparently major international treaties every 20 years, perhaps 21 is a very good moment to do so on artificial intelligence. And of course, uh, that role as an international standard setter is the uh, title topic of this panel. And I want to come to that uh, with, uh, with the panel. We don't have a whole lot of time, but I have a few specific audience questions that I do also want to bring in. So I'm going to request very short answers, if you'd be so kind, dear panelists. Um, first of all, a question that I think uh, is addressed to Salah Sastamoinen, and it regards the risk-based approach and how you institutionalize that? What goods and values should be considered relevant for the risk to be assessed? And who decides that in a specific case? A difficult question, and nonetheless, my request for a short answer. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that question. Uh, I'm afraid that I'm on the, on the stage. Uh, as I said, we are on the preparatory stage. So uh, I, I will not be able to come uh, yet out with all the details there one has to wait then this uh, the finalization of the process and the decisions of the uh, decisions of the uh, uh, college uh, 
in 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 general the legal requirements that would apply to the uh, so depending of the risk level of the applications uh, the applications would be distributed according to many actors uh, we, we are seeing that the, um, uh, the it, is, it would be according to a life cycle of AI I think that was uh, that was already mentioned by uh, there, Mrs. Ramos, that that is also it was looking the whole lo whole life cycle of the AI, and that there are different uh, different actors, the developers, the employees, uh, persons are using them, doing maintenance. So that's where we are addressing those actors who are best placed to address them the potential uh, risks. Uh, how much we are uh, how much we are defining these in uh, yeah, in detail in the in the regulation is under uh, under discussion because we can then still go then also for the uh, further uh, implement uh, implementation on that type of the uh, requirements so it might be that it is the basic uh, basic definitions uh, uh, there first uh, so I'm afraid that I'm a, I'm a, uh, we will, uh, in order then to uh, implement uh, uh, and how to look at, I, will, I was stressing that we want to and also then uh, work uh, naturally in the uh, closely with the national authorities. I said that, I mean, it is a union level uh, commission, but when it goes to implementation, there's also the national authorities. And maybe, well, maybe to, to finish, what comes out is naturally is the commission proposals. We always have to remember in the EU that that's not yet the EU legislation. It requires the European Parliament. It requires the European Council to take then those uh, uh, take then those final decisions. So that is that takes uh, some time. Naturally, the commission proposal will be the starting. Thank you very much uh, for that. Then let me go um, next uh, to Michael O'Flaherty with another audience question and again request for a short answer. I'm sorry uh, to, to keep repeating that. Uh, this question is, benefits are often pitted against dangers, innovation against regulation, but is this the right key of analysis? Shouldn't we base our approach on multidisciplinary scientific evidence? I put this question to you because you, of course, mentioned your study and the yeah. concrete application that you looked at? Yeah, look, there's two, there's two pillars. Uh, one is the law and the principles, and indeed the values that you were referring to in your earlier question. They're a given. They're committed to, and for us in the EU, the European Charter of Fundamental Rights, the Lisbon Treaty. They're non-negotiable. Uh, but then how do they apply in practice for human well-being and human thriving? That derives from a close examination of human reality, the use cases. Um, it, it, and that still requires a lot of research. Um, and it needs to be an ongoing exercise of research. Uh, because, because uh, I mean, this, this technology is moving by the day very, very fast. And so therefore, the way in which it engages with our lived experience is changing. But we cannot apply the values to the lived experience with the regulatory outcome. You can do it or you can't do it or you change the way you do it uh, without having all of that knowledge base. So whether it be from my agency or be from other entities in the EU and uh, more broadly, that's to be a sustained investment in the implied empirical analysis of what's going on out there on the ground, which, by the way, in large part will overcome those concerns about definitions that were referred to earlier. So evidentiary-based decision-making. Um, thank you very much. Another question from the audience, perhaps to you, Gabriele Ramos, because you talked about the need to be very inclusive in this debate. The, the, que the question or the remark is this. Emilia, who is a youth representative in Cahai, says, Cahai actually is the only space where AI regulation is being discussed with young people, part of the conversation. UN, EU, OECD all disregard young people as a stakeholder. Why and can that change? So perhaps you don't actually take that statement on board, but if you would speak to it. Well, I, I have to say that, uh, that we did uh, global consultations with youth representatives and actually the social and human science sector that I, that I uh, lead in UNESCO has a mandate to engage with youth. So I would say that uh, maybe we are not good enough in uh, communicating how much we uh, bring everybody together. But we also made a lot of effort to bring people with disabilities. We br brought people uh, with diverse background. We brought people from uh, that didn't know, have uh, learned and very high degrees of academic degrees because the reality is that this is touching everybody. 
And when I say that we want to engage this out is, is because we also need to understand this, where um, countries are and, and what are their needs, but it's not for UNESCO, it's not for the Council of Euro, it's not for an international institution to tell countries what to do. Everybody has their own preferences and some countries will be more innovative led, some countries will be more risk averse and more uh, reliant on, 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 a, on, on a full set of, of, of legislation. But the reality is that uh, we need to support those that are lagging behind. And this is our mandate. I think that the, the whole point is how do we ensure that we are not having the conversation among those that know the substance, but that we're really trying to incorporate those that are touched by the technologies but that, are, that, that don't even know when they browse into the system and when they get some uh, suggestions to do X or Y, they don't even know what's behind this. And I think it's very important that UNESCO as a house also of the education, communication, culture, science, that we will join forces uh, with, with, with all the institutions to ensure that at least we have the same level of understanding of where we are and where we want to go. Thank you very much. Uh, another audience question just uh, come in uh, back to Sala Sastamoinen, and uh, it concerns red lines for facial recognition. Will the proposal for a regulation for AI refer to this? The white paper did, and if not, why not? Yes, uh, thank you for that. Uh, thank you for that uh, uh, question. Uh, as regards the facial recognition, I will I, I, there. I, I go back actually what what uh, uh, Michael Flaherty said in the beginning. Already existing legislation applies, including then uh, the, the fundamental rights and the privacy legislation. So we have to also uh, keep that in mind that the EU data protection rules already have the relevance on this area, uh, on the processing of the biometric data uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the purpose of the identifying uh, a natural person, so using that type of the personal data, except when specific conditions. So if there is already that uh, regulation which in principle uh, 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 prohibits that. Well, we take that as a starting point. Uh, so one has to see what is the reason for this uh, kind of identification. So if there's a substantial, uh, substantial uh, public interest, and that interest is then looked on the EU or national law, and uh, in order to see if that is the, the use is uh, duly uh, justified. Uh, so uh, we are, uh, that type of the biometric data is there. So the facial uh, recognition is an exception for it's a remote uh, remote way of biometric identification and uh, i mentioned the example what is already covered because on that basis and as phase of the consultation of the white paper we are then uh, reflecting further steps uh, on that area and may i re uh, react to this uh, question on the inclusive participation and consultancy there uh, just as uh, just to say that i mean we we certainly are uh, uh, welcoming all type of the participation we have had an ai alliance that is open forum for for the for the young for the elder to participate to the discussion. So uh, 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 certainly we can be much better of making that public that to see that all those who are interested could be part of this consultative process. Thank you very much. Um, we're slowly coming to the end of our time, but uh, I have a couple more audience questions that have come in. So let me try to, again, uh, request quick answers uh, to these. Uh, to State Secretary Kastrup, uh, compared to German industry, civil society has a low impact on regulation. How does Germany ensure effectively including civil society in its work on regulating AI? Yeah, um, this, this is true uh, to a certain degree. I think also in Germany are already existing, uh, say, NGOs who uh, really do very, very good work in uh, coordinating the interests of the civil society. But uh, I agree that we could do much more. Uh, so we are working on several angles. Uh, so we are trying uh, to coordinate, for instance, institutions which are right now uh, tackling within uh, uh, the, 
the digital rooms, uh, for instance, hate speech and terrorism and uh, say personal offenses, uh, cyber grooming and what we try, for instance, the, these specific things that we try to, to, to help them, uh, to promote them and also to build alliances uh, within civil society to empower them to do more. So I think this is a bit beyond also the legal side. Of course, civil society is important voting uh, in the end for legal uh, support, but it's also empowering civil society and the organizations we already have and probably also bring them above critical thresholds. Uh, so you need a certain size uh, to, to, uh, to create your space and to be relevant for other users. But of course, it's a tricky thing. Uh, so, uh, especially on the on on the platforms where also AI is used, as we all know, uh, it, it's sometimes very difficult because uh, the big uh, commercial institutions are so powerful and they have so uh, high network effects, which is sometimes uh, hard uh, to tackle. So, but it's uh, one of my personal goals uh, to enhance this, say, empowering the civil society. Um, I do not say we are already Already there, but I think we have seen the problem and we're trying to do our best uh, in the next years. Thank you very much. And uh, Jan Kleissen, at the very outset of our discussions today, we talked about the fact that there was a fairly long lag period where it seemed as if uh, legislative and regulatory initiatives were um, essentially lagging far behind technological developments. Clearly now, there is a multitude of actors getting involved in proposing ethical frameworks, legislative initiatives, uh, and so on. How can cooperation be enhanced? What's needed to avoid duplication and to drive efforts forward in a really coherent and effective manner? I think it's it's clear that there is a clear legislative gap between the development of technology and its and its regulation. Um, in the case of AI, actually and and actually most digital technology, quite extraordinary. So uh, you would not want to drive a car. Uh, and Natalie Smoa was kind enough to 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 also quote quote this example earlier. Uh, if there hadn't been proper safety standards, you wouldn't like to leave it to the ethical consciousness of the company that makes the car, uh, or to some general recommendation that it, perhaps it's advisable to drive on the right side if you like. Uh, but you might also not do so. I mean, there's very strict there are very strict rules. Um, uh, and one comment on innovation in this respect. The car industry, of course, is highly regulated and highly innovative, but think also of pharmaceuticals. Uh, the pharmaceutical industry is about the most strictly regulated industry in the world, yet it's also, as the rapid development of vaccines has proven, one of the most innovative industries in the world. So in innovation and regulation, good regulation, uh, do really do go together. Um, to come to your question on, on cooperation, the important, uh, I think, it's to be uh, working with all stakeholders. Um, uh, we've talked a lot about CAHAI. Uh, let me just also add that that is not the only initiative that's going on in the Council of Europe. We uh, also work on a, a possibly, possibly a convention on criminal law and AI, uh, notably with regard to self-driving cars, uh, as one of the more vertical, the more sector-specific uh, rules and as, as, as was mentioned before we have rules on uh, the ethical use of AI in the judiciary, AI in data protection, AI and non-discrimination -discrimin and in all of these areas we work uh, and you mentioned cooperation we work together of course with our member states with other international organizations everyone in this panel is also has a seat at the table in these various bodies, and notably also in CAHAI, of course. We do work with um, uh, civil society. I'm very happy that it was uh, mentioned that youth organizations do have a role. We think they're very important. So they should have a seat at the table in CAHAI, and they do so, and we do listen to them. Uh, because, of course, uh, when you think about future-oriented technology, uh, it is essential to have youth, youth on board. We also have industry on board. We have a partnership agreement with some 26 major companies, including all the big American ones, uh, and a number of smaller European uh, uh, companies and associations. Uh, we have academia, 
uh, and we try to reach out to, to other states. It's interesting, perhaps, to, to add here that, for instance, Israel requested to join the negotiations on Kahai. Uh, Colombia has expressed an interest. Uh, so we really hope to, to uh, go beyond, beyond our borders. Um, but it is high time. And in closing, let me just stress this, perhaps. Um, it is really urgent uh, that we uh, achieve some real results. Um, it was said by many speakers here, uh, the, when states delegate to technology, when they delegate responsibility for human rights and uh, rule of law, or at least for decisions that give a huge impact on the human rights and rule of law, um, it must be checked. Uh, artificial intelligence is doing a lot of back, uh, background checks on humans. Perhaps it is time that humans also do more background checks on artificial intelligence systems. Thank you very, very much uh, for that. We are basically out of time, so I'm going to do this. I'm going to let, uh, essentially, Jan Kleisen has answered this question, but I'm going to let the other four panelists complete one sentence. So literally, just give me the end of this sentence, please. And it is the sentence that is the title of this closing panel. COE and the EU can be international standard setters for the regulation of AI because, and I'll start with, uh, with uh, Salah Sastamoinen, please. Thank you. I would usually say that because we are doing a, a thorough, uh, a thorough uh, study and survey work to back up our work, it will be evidence-based. So I have one more uh, opportunity to welcome the feasibility study that we are from the Baha'i that we are working with today. Thank you very much. Michael O'Flaherty, your uh, answer to the, or your end of that sentence? Because they're putting rights and values at the heart of the initiatives and in so doing are drawing from universal values that can speak to every part of this world. Thank you very much. Gabriela Ramos. I, I believe they are already standard setters. Uh, but they will be stronger if they do what they did today, invite all of us and, and partner with the other institutions. And if we focus not only on the technologies, on the how, but how are we going to use these to resolve the challenges that we're facing? Inequality, climate, gender divides, let's not lose focus. The technologies need to contribute to what we are really trying to build as humans and as societies. Thank you very much. Kristen Castor. I think you're on mute, sir. Sorry, yeah, that was too, too slow. <laughs> because Europe is really a trademark uh, also for open liberal, liberal democracy with a human-centric approach. And this is what we should bring into the global discussion with all the other institutions on board. Thank you. And Jan Kleissen, they were also disciplined. Let me ask you to also give us your second half of the sentence. Um, do it together based on our common values. Thank you. Wonderful. Many thanks to all of you for this very, very thought-provoking, very interesting exchange. I must say, given the wide-ranging and complex nature of many of our discussions uh, today, I must confess to a bit of relief that it does not fall to me to wrap up our proceedings. For that, it is my pleasure to hand over the floor to